You're listening to dialectradio.co.uk, your local community radio run by volunteers. Log on to our website at dialectradio.co.uk to find out more. David Guinness is a member of the Guinness family. He went to Eton and he was on this show back on the 22nd of June talking about Yugoslavia. But here he is talking about the brain drain in the 1960s mainly uh, and also tidal power. Because he's an engineer, he's interested in these things and he believes tidal power is far, far better to have in the Bristol Channel than nuclear at Hinkley. So here's David Guinness. Whatever happened to British technology? My name's David Guinness. Now, you can probably guess by my name that I was born into a wealthy, um, upper-class family. And the thing that really turned me on was making model aircraft. And we put engines on them, and they flew. And they flew so fast and far that we had to chase after them on Chobham Common. So that's how I first got interested in engineering. But I was born into the upper class. I was sent to Eton. School for scoundrels. Well, I left thinking that I was a superior human being. And inequality was built into the whole structure of Eton. By clothes, social status at Eton was judged by sports, whether you were good at sports. And if you were good at um, athletics, you wore one cap. If you were good at football, you wore another cap. In the summer, you'd wear a blazer. Quite frankly, I was useless at sports because I had terrible sight. I had to squint. I had to play squash by myself. It was ridiculous. Um, Discipline was largely exercised by the senior boys. In my house, Eton was divided into houses of 50 or 60 boys. And my house was run by the library, it was called, of six six boys. And I was beaten repeatedly, and uh, people used to put blotting paper in their trousers to reduce the pain of, of, uh, of the cane being... Administered. I mean, was there any sort of justice, do you think, in the way that it was used? Um, well, as far as I, I, I was concerned, no. I could never uh, understand why uh, I was beaten. They said to me, every time you come in here, you, you, you've got some excuse. And, and uh, I don't know, uh, um, I, I was beaten for, for well... Um, one of the things I did at Eton was to build a, a um, 14-foot sailing boat. That was in the School of Mechanics, and I was found in the School of Mechanics out of hours. So I was beaten for that. So then you went into National Service. How long was that? And that was uh, everybody had to do that, didn't they? I was in for about 18 months because I'd got a guaranteed place at Cambridge. And they let me out early so that I I, I could start the um, September term at Cambridge. But um, how I became an officer, I simply don't know. Part of it was parading uh, up and down Buckingham Palace wearing a basket uh, uh, and a scarlet tunic and me issuing commands to, to, to my platoon. The whole thing didn't do anything for me at all because my interpersonal skills, frankly, by the time I left the army were approximately zero. But you come from a military family. I was from a military family and yet I couldn't make sense of it all. We had the Christian church which talked about loving your neighbour and that didn't exactly mean killing your neighbour. But um, that was what, what, what I'm, I'm, I was brought up to do. I was born into a very military family. My, my uncle was Marshal of the RAF, Sir John Slessor. A cousin of my mother's 
was Lord Portal of Hungerford, who was in charge of the Battle of Britain. There were politics throughout my, my upbringing. My godmother was the granddaughter of Sir Robert Peel. My godfather, Charles Doughty, was, was an MP. And my father always wanted to be an MP, but never could, because he was a sort of emotional invalid, really. He had a breakdown in China, I think, when his mother died, and he never really recovered from, from that. After National Service in, in Eton, you got into engineering. How exactly? Well, I had a false start at Cambridge trying to read mathematics. Couldn't do it, so came down. So I went back to read um, engineering. And engineering at Cambridge w- was incredible. The engineering schools were so well equipped. I mean, we we did practicals on engines that that came out out of rovers. There was an enormous submarine engine, a submarine electric motor, which we did practicals on. We're talking about 1959 there. Anyway, I got a, a degree. Then... I got a job in electronics, and it was Hawker Siddeley Dynamics, which was involved in making guided missiles. And I loved electronics. I can remember one Christmas where where, where I asked permission to work over Christmas because I enjoyed it so, so much. And during that time, I designed the electronics for the first laser-guided homing head. At that point, I felt I was saving the world from communism. Hawker Siddeley Dynamics were at Hatfield, had a huge runaway and, and aircraft could, could land on, on it. We would test the design at Farnborough, The basic thing of it was shining a laser at a target. It was an extremely powerful laser. We had to wear green glasses to protect our eyes. And an aircraft would fly over with the laser-guided missile and home on the target that was being irradiated by the laser. And I reckon that that was used in the Falklands War. I think I I was one of the first people to work on it. I mean, I I was working in the Advanced Projects Department of um, Hawker Siddeley Dynamics, and we had people from the Ministry of Defence coming up to see what we were doing. They, of course, were very pleased. But um, I must say, um, now... I reckon someone making the atom bomb said he'd known sin. Well, I think I'd known sin designing this homing head. In uh, Hawker Siddeley Dynamics, we were doing firsts. We made a a, um, guided missile called Martel, codename AJ-168. We made infrared-seeking guided missiles which were sent off in the direction of an aircraft and then home on the heat coming from the engines and blow up the aircraft. So whatever happened to British engineering in the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s, it looked like Britain was leading the world? Well, look, I think I'd better digress because it was the time of the brain drain and I got a job with Chrysler Corporation working on the U.S. space program. That was an absolute eye-opener to to me. It was an eye-opener to me because I was working with American engineers, and they held themselves high, they, they were enjoying themselves, they were in contrast to British engineers who always had a moan about something. But I'll come to that later, if I may. Now, I spent a year on the space program. If I hadn't spent a year there, I'd have had to have repaid my travelling expenses across. But then I did an extraordinary thing. 
which was to go to an American business school. And I went to the business school of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And it was possibly one of the most liberal business schools in the United States. For example, at the end of each semester, we used to grade the lecturers. They didn't grade us. We students graded the lecturers. Encounter groups were part of the course. In sociology, we chose the subjects that we were going to discuss each week. So this was so liberal, and I started to feel this is worth more than the whole of my three years at Cambridge, because you can say what you think, you can have any attitude you like, for capitalism, against capitalism. And it literally blew my mind. Before going to MIT, my politics were sort of middle centre. After leaving MIT, I only stayed there a year, my politics were something to the left of Jeremy Corbyn. (laughs) Well, let's just go back to the space programme. What were you doing for them? Well, I was working on an enormous computer programme which was working out the optimum flight path that Apollo 1 or 2 would go to put a man on the moon. We were trying to work out the flight path so that the space vehicle could take the maximum payload um, to the moon. And I had to learn about a thing called the calculus of variations. Well, it was so difficult... The problem was proposed by Leibniz, and it was only solved ten years later. It was actually my year working on the space program was one of the most boring jobs I've ever done. I actually jumped for joy when I I read the acceptance letter for, for MIT. I'd learnt computer programming in my spare time and I went up to Boston and got a summer job as a a computer programmer. Let's get back to the brain drain. Yes. Well, I suppose people were hoping that I would come back. My godfather was hoping that actually I did come back but I flew back the wrong way around the world and I visited Japan, Hong Kong, Vietnam while the fighting was still going on, then went to Tehran and I then went to Tito's Yugoslavia which you've all already broadcast my thoughts about. And then I came back to this country on my 30th birthday, and I actually spoke at Speaker's Corner. I spoke about Yugoslavia, and a heckler said, Look, mate, if you think Yugoslavia is such a nice place, why don't you go and live there? So then I took a path which absolutely shocked my family. I said, Look, If I'm going to talk about workers' control, I need some qualification. So for the next two and a half years, I worked as an assembly worker at the PTA plant at Ford's Dagenham with the object of trying to become a shop steward. And I did become a shop steward, and it's one of the things I'm most proud of. I was a shop steward for six months. I wasn't a very good shop steward because I didn't have the interpersonal skills um, to um, do it. But I did once um, stop, stop the line, which was the ultimate crime at Ford's. I stopped the line through a safety issue. Now, the subject of this talk is whatever happened to British technology... And technology is, by and large, created by engineers. So we've got to look at engineers in this country, and in particular, how they're treated by the establishment. Because I hate to say it, 
but the establishment runs this country. I mean, we've got a Tory party in, in government for, well, for, it'll have been in government for 10 years and um, wrecked p- p- parts of the country with things like the bedroom tax. It's the top layer of, of people who are almost certainly have been to public school. Um, most of the senior civil servants have been to public school. But they're also the landed gentry, because in this country we have the most iniquitous maldistribution of land. There'd be members of the House of Lords, probably. Some of the Labour members gradually get sucked in to being members of the, the establishment. And the church as well. Don't let's forget the church. The bishops are in the House of Lords. And for a large part of this history, this country was kept under control by the church. It's uh, nothing like so so much now. I don't know what keeps this country uh, under control, possibly the media. The establishment of the role in engineering was this, and it was different in wartime to peacetime. Now, in wartime, the establishment regarded engineers as heroes. In the First World War, they, they, they were caught napping, and they designed and built tanks, which did, didn't exist before. In the Second World War, they designed and built aircraft. We all know about the Spitfires and the Hurricanes, and later Whittle designing the jet engine. That was how they were regarded in wartime. They were regarded in wartime as heroes. Now we come to peacetime. And in peacetime, engineers were regarded very differently. They were either ignored, disliked, or regarded as a nuisance. And I'll give you three examples of those. And we'll have to go back to the 19th century when the railways were being built. The railways had the most colossal effect on the social, political and financial aspects of this country. People who'd been out of work for years suddenly had a job and an income. And what happened, the two principal things, as I see it, were the two great reform acts in 1832 and in 1867, which vastly increased the number of people in the country who had the right to a parliamentary vote. Now, that was a slap in the face of the establishment. But it was followed not long afterwards by the First World War, followed by the Second World War. And then we had the advent of television, which was designed and created and manufactured by engineers. And they um, found a way to broadcast television signals so that people who had television sets in, in increasing numbers could see what was going on. And all sorts of things appeared on people's television screens, including live shots of the House of Commons. And during those live shots they could quite likely see members of Parliament asleep on the back benches. Well, that was a pretty good slap in the face to the establishment because television vastly increased people's political awareness. They saw politicians being grilled by um, interviewers. That's the second example. The third example is the 2011 riots. And they were put down almost entirely to social media, which again was designed and put into production by engineers. And the social media enabled people to gather together in numbers so quickly that the police had no power to stop them. They would then perhaps break into a shop, loot it, 
or even set fire to the shop, as they did in, in South London. So, frankly, if you look at it uh, and take it, take it bluntly, it was engineers that enabled the 2011 riots. Now, do you blame the establishment for being very wary of engineers after that? If engineers could create riots, well, we'd better watch out. Now, and people have forgotten about this, but the world's first personal computer was invented by someone called Clive Sinclair. He developed it and he put it into production. Now, Clive Sinclair went to the city and he asked for a large sum of money so that he could build a manufacturing facility for personal computers. And my guess was what happened was this. The banker would have said, personal computers, what are they? We don't want everybody to have, have a personal computer. So Clive Sinclair went back empty-handed, and in frustration he built, actually, a very dangerous electric car which went into limited production. But the story doesn't stop there, because what happened was the early computers, at the same time the Internet was developed, and the establishment realised that a personal computer connected to the internet was the perfect way to keep tabs on the person who was using the computer. So we suddenly had Tony Blair trying to get computers into schools uh, everywhere, m massive sums of money on IT programs. And in Cheltenham we had the development of G GCHQ, which was able to scan all emails um, that came out in the Snowden revelations. But what was causing the brain drain was how appallingly in this country engineers were treated in peacetime. As I've said, they were either ignored, disliked, or reckoned to be a nuisance. I once went to a party and um, said, I've got a job uh, making guided missiles. And what happened? The bloke said, come and have a drink at the bar to get rid of me. It was the low social status of engineers. The Institution of Electrical Engineers was abolished. And I reckon it, it, it was because it was too dangerous. I mean, don't uh, organisations like the Royal Society show some excellence still to this day? Well, they do, and, and there's the Institution of Civil Engineers, there's the Institution of Mechanical e Engineers. Basically, they're people who are designing motorway bridges, that sort of thing. Um, but as we all know, cars, if you drive down a motorway these days, all you see is foreign-designed cars. The British establishment was quite happy with that. What they didn't want to see was British-designed um, cars because that meant British engineers gaining skills. And it was that that led people to, to seek jobs abroad. I mean, Australia was crying out for engineers. You could get a £10 passage to, to Australia. I can remember reading in my professional journal, which was called Engineering and Technology. This is a funny organisation called the Institute for Engineering and Technology, which replaced the Institute of Electrical Engineers. And I can remember an article in it which said, if you're looking for a job, your best bet is to learn a bit of German and go to Germany where you'll be respected and get a job. Engineering had turned out to be a threat to the established order of this country. It had created the Reform Acts in the 19th century. 
Then there's television, where, where you saw MPs being ridiculed. And then we had the 2011 riots due to social media. Do you think that Britain is still producing good engineers that simply aren't getting, maybe they're languishing on the on the dole or working in call centres? Well, um, if there's a graduate engineer listening, someone who's got a degree in engineering, I'd say, look, your best chance for a job is either with GCHQ... Um, who are crying out for for um, software e- e- engineers, or with BAE systems, which make aircraft, m- missiles, and torture equipment, and sell them to countries like Saudi Arabia, they're crying out, out for jobs. If that doesn't work, your best bet is to learn a bit of German and emigrate to Germany or France. Now, what I see in the future is this. This country is an island, and it's absolutely crying out for tidal power. The number of sites in this country that are suitable for tidal power, well, the numbers that I read vary, but there's certainly eight, and I've seen numbers as big as 16. And what's happened is that tidal power has become a great deal cheaper. Rather than having barrages, we've all heard of the seven barrage. Well, they've been talking about that apparently since the 1930s. Well, well exactly, and, and it's enormously expensive. We hear all sorts of stories that it's going to ruin the wildlife and, and the fish in, in, in the seven. But we haven't heard much about this. But Nicola Sturgeon is opening a new tidal power facility right on the north of Scotland, where there's extremely strong tides. It's being put in by a consortium of companies. The government's put in a paltry sum, but a lot of it's been raised by a company called Atlantis. And... That's what needs to happen all over the country. My view is that I'm not Theresa May. If I was, I'd do four things. One is appoint a qualified engineer to my cabinet. There isn't one at all at the moment. Two is cancel the absurd HS2 which means demolishing a whole chunk of Camden in order to to get to the terminus that's being proposed. Three, cancel the extremely dangerous Hinkley Point C. To me, handing the keys of a nuclear power station over to the Chinese is little short of crackpot and invest the savings from HS2 and Hinkley Point C into a massive development of tidal power. Now, my view is if that's done, that will bring back into this country people who have left with the brain drain. They'll want to be part of this, and Britain will then become a great engineering country again. Look, the problem is the City of London makes so much money by computer-assisted gambling. That's what goes on. The price of gold goes up, so the computer automatically buys gold shares. The price of gold goes down. The computer automatically sells the gold shares and in the process makes a lot of money. So what happens is if some company approaches a bank and say, look, um, can you give us some start-up funds, it's too much like hard work. They've got to look at the business plan of this company. They've got to meet the people involved, find out what experience they've got. Sorry, but it's much easier to make our millions by the computers churning away in the basement. David Guinness there, talking about whatever happened 
to British technology. That's all for this week. Dialect is Bristol's first weekly MP3 podcast. If you're online, you can subscribe to our emails or download the podcast from dialectradio.co.uk. Thanks to our studio engineer, Dave Bazanko. Dialects of Bristol Broadband Co-op Production. Catch us on Bristol Community FM 93.2 every Tuesday at noon and anyone can contribute. You can contact us through the People's Republic of Stokes Croft just off Jamaica Street on 0117 909 6897 or online at prsc.org.uk. You can also find us on the volunteering websites at Volunteering Bristol on 0117 989 7733 or online one word volunteerbristol.org.uk or the national volunteering site do-it.org That was Dialect and I'm Tony Gosling wishing you a very good week Thanks for listening, till the same time next week Goodbye for now (laughs) 